quit. I'm not coming back. What the hell? Oh, there's two more. Uh, okay, folks, uh, it's 7 o'clock. Uh, it's May, May 15th, uh, 2018, uh, planning board meeting. My name is Kathy Barnard. I'm the chairman of the planning board. And uh, let me introduce the other planning board members. Uh, to, uh, down at the end of the table to, the, to uh, my right, Brad Harriman, who's the uh, representative from the Board of Selectmen. Next to uh, Brad, John Thurston and Mike Cotter. Uh, to my left, uh, Von Dugan, who is the vice chairman of the planning board, and um, uh, Peter Goodwin, uh, also uh, Matt Sullivan, the um, planning directors here this evening. Uh, we have uh, two public hearings scheduled tonight, and we'd like to uh, change the order of them. Uh, and do the uh, Town of Wolfboro Municipal Electric Department first. So uh, let me read that into the record. This is uh, a, a public hearing, Town of Wolfboro Municipal Electric Department. This is for a special use permit, uh, tax cap 189-8. And uh, what will happen first is the uh, uh, applicant will make the presentation and explain the project uh, to everyone. Uh, then Matt Sullivan may have some comments and uh, make and some issues that uh, he wants the planning board to uh, pay attention to. Uh, and after that has happened, do, do I have to accept this as a complete application? Oh, you uh, yeah, don't have to. Not. So once we do that, then I'll open the uh, public hearing and any member of the public that's here, uh, that would be your opportunity to uh, comment. Uh, these two applications tonight are a little different. Um, they're uh, both uh, municipal applications, and so uh, the job of the planning board is not to approve a, an application. Instead, it is to, to make some comments and and suggestions if there are uh, issues that they feel that the applicant should address. Uh, we may su make some suggested conditions, but again, those are actually suggested conditions, and uh, the applicant is not under any obligation to, to do them, except that we hope that they do. So, uh, anyway, the uh, applicant, uh, Barry, are you going to? start off here okay good evening Barry Muccio uh, director of operations for the electric department for those of you who are participating in the CIP process this this uh, project should be fairly familiar to you um, this was a 2018 project uh, to rebuild the 390 line which is our sole source of power into into Wolfboro it was constructed early 60s, I believe it was 63, so we'll be uh, 55 years old this year. Um, some of the infrastructure, pole structures, insulators, and, and whatnot are, are reaching an, an age and a condition where, um, you know, we start to start to worry about their reliability. They're really at their useful age. They've, they've reached that lifespan. So um, the project is, is basically to rebuild the line in place, pole for pole. The, the, for those of you who don't, aren't aware or familiar with the, the, uh, the, how the line traverses, you can see it. It's shown in there in red. Um, we own the section from, oh, there we go. Thank you. So we own the section from the, uh, the Wolfboro Tuftonboro town line, which happens to be right at the RIB site. And we own approximately 3.6 miles, I believe, of it is what the, uh, uh, what the distance is, and it terminates down here in back of the power plant, the old substation number one site, uh, which is our intention actually at uh, some point to reutilize that last mile or so uh, with a future project of, an, of another substation. So again, this was put in, this is the original line, put in in 63. So um, uh, the intent John, were you, were you around then? Yeah, you probably remember. No? <laughs> I don't know, you were smart. Was. <laughs> Kathy, you remember it. Prior to that, everything was served out of the power plant. 
and this was our, this was our connection to the outside world. Um, again, as you traverse that whole route, there are some, there are some wetlands uh, that we cross um, throughout, I think there's 24 locations, if I'm not wrong, that we, uh, that we'll, we'll be, have some minimum impact to. We certainly will have to address uh, silt fence, any work that's done there will have to be done utilizing timber matting uh, to protect those sensitive areas. Um, yeah, so it, this is for the special use. Our intent is to file with the state with a utilizing a wetlands utility maintenance notification form. Um, Do you want to have Greg walk through the wetland impacts? Yeah, and, and, and uh, Greg Howard from uh, North Country Soil Services could answer probably some of the wetlands um, questions or, or issues which may come up. I don't know if that is any help, Greg. I, probably not. Uh, so in regards to the project, I was retained to delineate the wetlands within the utility right-of-way from can the Tufta Brook. Can you just give us your name for the record? I'm sorry, Greg Howard, North Country Soil Services. So I was retained to delineate the jurisdictional wetlands within the right-of-way from the Tufton Borough Town Line to the location on this side of uh, Back Bay. Um, those materials, those uh, wetland boundaries were located by HE, uh, HEB engineers, and they formed the base plan from which the design for the replacement in kind for the utility line well, we're based. Uh, we had, in total, within the, within the wetland areas, the poles being replaced, we had six. Within the prime wetland area, which is the Klaus Brook uh, complex from where Filter Bed Road and then running across to Back Bay, we have five poles that are being replaced, and then within the 25-foot wetland buffer for the non-prime wetland, we have six uh, utility poles, and with the, within the 100-foot prime wetland buffer, we have 10 utility poles. The, the work, as noted by Barry, is going to be permitted by the state and the federal government under that utility, the wetlands utility maintenance notification form as long as we comply with the required best management practices for utility line maintenance. It's a manual that's put together by the, by the state of New Hampshire. The access to these pole locations, the needed crossings to get to the needed pole locations and doing the other work, as shown on the plan, the vegetation would be either cut if we have brush small trees and things, they would be cut at grade before the timber mats are placed. We would try to maintain all the vegetation um, outside of the utility pole footprints to be maintained so once the timber mats are replaced, because they're not going to be in place for any extended period of time, most all of that vegetation is going to rebound, it's going to recover. So that we're doing two things, we're maintaining the vegetative cover and we're reducing or almost eliminating soil erosion with those root systems being held in place and not having bare soil surfaces. For the bare soil surface areas, uh, those will be restored and seeded and all the sediment erosion control practices will remain in place until we have vegetation reestablished. As part of the process, there'll be periodic monitoring of the work to make sure that we don't have any issues that arise following high intensity rainfall events or where we have significant amounts of work that have been that have been conducted so that we can stay ahead of something becoming a problem uh, main, making sure that all the sediment erosion control practices are being maintained um, Vegetation that's going to be cut in the Close Brook section from Bay Street towards Filter Bed Road has become extremely overgrown, that shrub tree layer that's now present there. We've asked for those materials to be cut and pulled out of there 
and then disposed of off-site somewhere else. I'm expecting that that would mean that they would run, and run that material through a chipper and be disposed. The stuff is so coarse, I didn't want it just cut and dropped because that might create an issue with, in terms of starting to adversely impact the vegetative community that's already, that's already there. Um, and also with the intent to try to minimize the time before a cycle of maintenance, uh, maintenance cutting would have to occur again. I guess outside of that, I'd take any direct questions that people have in regards to the, the procedures that we've outlined both in the plan and also within the, the text for the, the uh, cover correspondence they generated for the application. So I wonder about the line and the difference between how it looks now and how it will look in the future, you know, in terms of apparatus and style. Yeah, in, in, regards, to, in regards to the line itself, it's going to look very similar to what you see there now. Um, it will be reconducted with a, with a larger diameter wire, but it's nothing really noticeable from the ground. The poles are going up 10 feet in height, uh, and a lot of that's got to do with just we need to keep the old, the old circuit energized while we're working on the new, so we build it over it. And as well, by going up 10 feet in height, it gets us out of some of those tree fall uh, events that we have, because we get up out of that fall zone. And then as well, it allows us to meet some of those minimum clearances from the ground uh, to the energized conductors. As that geography has changed a bit out there, we've, I don't think we meet the current standards from, for height. Um, is it still a single pole? Or is it one of those cat-like? Um, I believe there will be still some H-frame conductors. And, uh, Alan could perhaps speak to that. I think we still will have a few, but what you see is typically 95% of it, I believe, is going to be single pole structure with a cross arm and three conductors, much like you see out there now. And, and how does it now cross Back Bay, and what is that going to look like? It will, it will look very similar to what's there now. In fact, the crossing of Back Bay, because that's not energized at this point, that won't be going up anything any further in height. So that'll look very similar to what you see there now, following the same route, just replacing the poles. Uh, and there's just a pole on either shore? Is that how it works? There are H-frame H -frame structures on either shore of that, and it's because it's such a long span there. It's, it, you couldn't support that with a simple single pole. Did, did you consider putting that under that thing? Consider putting it under under Back Bay, yeah, I know that that, that topic's come up, come up in the past. Um, it certainly escalates the cost of this project as well. I think you need to, you need to realize by doing that, um, you need to build some redundancy into that line, so you almost have to build it twice. Um, because this, if you ever lost one of those cables, it's not a simple fix of pulling one out and putting a new one in. It, you'd be down for quite a duration. It's not like something we can access relatively simply. And, and the other part of that is uh, by going under anything like that, you have to think about the environmental impacts of that as well. You have to set up on either shoreline of that, which is both wetland areas right there. Um, and I'm assuming you're talking like a directional boring type of activity. Um, it's not as simple as putting a little hole there and, and, and drilling, drilling in and you don't see it. You really have to start with a Pretty substantial starting point, pretty substantial pits dug. Um, somehow you have to terminate each one of those cables on, their, on either side with some sort of structure. So you, you're still going to have that. So I think in regards to the environmental side, you're going to probably have uh, a larger impact to that prime wetlands area by, by trying that. But if that line isn't energized right now, why does it need to be put back in place? Well, our, our long-term plan, and it's actually not that long-term now, uh, Peter, is uh, we hope to put a new substation site down in back of the power plant as exists where that old fenced-in area is. Uh, and, that's, and, you know, part of that is getting our, a new substation closer to our load base 
which is self-made. You know, you know, it's uh, get us closer. It gets us a mile and a half or so closer to that, and it diversifies our load. We have to get rid of our old 4 kV substation as we uh, as we take that out, decommission that. We need something to to take its place. That that site would take take its place. Would have to re-energize that line now to feed that. So how is that electricity now delivered to the to the South Main? It's done through everything comes out of uh, the Pilter Bed Road, this, what we refer to as substation number three site, um, which is not too far from the uh, not too far from the lagoon there. I lose my red light. So it's substation number two is in here. Substation number three site is somewhere right in this general area. And our intent is to get another substation, you know, down in here closer to our load. And the other thing that does, it sort of diversifies our source. Like right now, we have sort of all our eggs in one basket in that area. You start thinking about a storm event that comes through. In that one area, you could take out all of our substation in one, at one event. So you, you sort of like to have those things spread out, diversified a bit in areas so that you're not... You're not all fed from one location, so. I guess, I guess uh, what I'm sort of saying is that there would be some benefit for the beauty of Back Bay if there weren't overhead power lines there. And so what would be an estimate of the cost to do it in a different way? Um, perhaps Alan Rice can, or of PLM, who has done the, our structural engineering style, and I think he's done some projects similar to that. Um, he could perhaps answer that question better than, better than I can in regards to what that does to the cost. I'm uh, Alan Rice with PLM Electric Power Engineering, and we support the town's electric department with engineering services. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so the, um, basically, in order to transition that line from overhead to underground within the section we're talking about, which is obviously the, probably the major focus is the, the back bay crossing itself, but and which is about 460 odd feet from existing pole to pole across that. Um, immediately adjacent to that on the north side is a large wetland area uh, with a very small causeway in between, there's a walking path there, just about room to fit the structure that's there. Uh, and that adjacent wetland is about another 480 feet or so to the next set of structures, which is the last of the, the two pole structures that's there. So there's actually one each side of the back bay crossing and one at Bay Street where we span uh, the other 485 feet. So. All told, if you count that entire wetland area from Bay Street to downtown, we're looking at something that's approaching 950 feet or thereabouts. So that's, in order to put that underground, that's about the length of, of that you're talking about. Um, so that in itself becomes um, costly. Um, the, as Barry said, it becomes a challenge to figure out, even if you do put it underground, where do you transition from overhead to underground? Um, what properties and so forth do you impact in the process of, of doing that? Uh, the directional boring that was referred to is the way that you would, would do this crossing. Uh, it requires a fairly substantial outer pipe that then houses electrical conduits for the electrical cables inside of that. So they would drill across and they would then pull back the larger pipe. Um, the project that I worked on before, we put in four electrical conduits inside of a 16 inch outer pipe and we brought it under uh, Interstate 93 down in Braintree, Massachusetts. Uh, it was about 400 feet. Um, so this would be, be longer. Um, and that project, which involved a, a parallel bore, but from the same staging points for a water pipe, so in total about 800 feet of boring, I guess, um, 
was done around 2006, we had, just for the boring, the contractor's bids were, the low bid was about $470,000, and then we had two additional bids that were in the eight to $900,000 range. Um, and that's before you do any of the electrical infrastructure that's required to put the cabling in and so forth. So I think at this point, given inflation and the complexity of the job and the length of it, which may require larger machinery and, and so forth, I would say that you're probably looking at a differential cost maybe of eight or nine hundred thousand dollars on the project. By the time you put a little bit of contingency on that to cover whatever may happen, uh, it could be well over a million dollars of, of differential cost. So it's a, it's a substantial undertaking. Um, hopefully that's not too long-winded, but... Oh, no, and, yeah. and you, were, you were citing your experience. Yes. And you're, you're citing a, a possible cost for this. Of you're not going to have to drill and bore stuff because it's, you know, so, oil, but right. you're still talking half a million dollars to a million dollars. Correct. Other questions? Question for Mr. Howard. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, the wetland delineations were done at the height of the summer. Would you have found any different results had they been done earlier in the summer when the ground was wetter, perhaps? No, because what's what's done is that we use what's called the the federal the, the federal delineation manual, and it's a three parameter approach. So we're looking at um, the presence of hydric soils hydrology, and then a predominance of what they call hydrophytic vegetation. The, the reality is, is that what we really key in on are the soils, and it's the colors that the soils present due to the lack of oxi oxygen. Mm -hmm. So you're looking for reduced features in these, in these soils, so that allows us to do the work no matter what time of year, so that we're not uh, restricted to just looking at things during, let's say, the, the spring, early summer. So your findings would have been applicable no matter what time of year they were found in? Correct. Okay. Um, when you come to use the chipper to remove the stuff down by Clow Brook, <clears throat> there may be bittersweet in there. Will you have some way of controlling that? If you're going to be removing all the stuff off-site, is that what you did say? Oh, it, it, if we have stuff that in that area has quite a bit of bittersweet and several other invasive species and all like that, that generally you look to have that material buried yeah. by X number of feet of, feet of material or um, in some other way disposed of. We, we don't have that feasibility here, but in some cases, if you've got a soil processing plant where they incinerate, you can do that so that you manage the seed stock that might be contained in those materials. It's the same thing for Japanese knotweed and some of these others. I understand. What, what are your plans on getting rid of that stuff so that it doesn't come back from the bits that get chipped and naturally propagate themselves? I, they're are you taking it off site? The material that's being removed is being taken off site okay. and it's going to be hand, managed properly. That's, that's going to be a detail that will be worked out with a contractor as to what provisions they're going to make. Yep. how they want to, to handle it, and then whether or not it's going to be appropriate. Mm -hmm. the, the presence of bittersweet in these other invasive species, we're not accounting for doing some type of control for what's already already established. Because oh, it's no, already my, my only concern is that what you do take out yep. doesn't get left on the ground to repropagate and come back again in a year or two, which is what it would do if it were not removed from site. If we have cuttings that fall back within the wet area where the bittersweet already occurs, we have the same situation. I mean, it's it's already there. It's there. It's there in the adjacent landscape also. I'm just concerned if you're taking it out, cutting it down, and chipping it up, it would be good to remove it from the site so that the oh, we're not we're not planning to dump the chips back. In. What I'm referring about offsite is it goes through a chipper into a truck, and then we manage it somewhere somewhere else. Okay, that's that's good. I want to say this. I thought this was an exemplary application. This was quite well done. If I could just clarify one thing. In regards to that reclearing of that vegetation, we've always done that as part of our annual maintenance. So it's not like that'll be the first time that that area has, has gone through. We're, we're on a seven-year cycle. The reason that last section um, 
from Filterbed Road back into town is, is overgrown is because we've, we've had that dead for seven, eight years now, and so we've allowed that to grow back. But typically, we would, we would uh, trim that, cut that back on a seven-year cycle, much like Eversource does on their end. So it's not like a brand new cut. It's, it's re-clearing what, what was the original right-of-way. Okay, thanks, Barry. Thank you. Brad? Yeah, got, uh, one question for Barry. Um, once the new line is all up and installed, obviously you're explaining you're going to build it 10 feet above the existing line that's out there now. Are you then going to go back and completely remove the old line, or are you going to leave it in place? Yeah, it, it would be completely removed. We would, um, we would switch or probably simultaneously power both of them and then have a, have a day in which we switch over to the, uh, you know, switch all over to the new line and then de-energize the old and then it would all be removed. Yep. Yeah, everything would be removed. Okay. So. Thank you. Everything would be centered. Everything would be centered like much like it is right now right. in the right way. Hey, Matt, before I go to the public, is there anything else that you wanted to add? Or? No, I think the application reflects the correct implementation of BMPs for wetlands impacts. Um, just two questions quickly for Barry because I know we have some abutters here. You almost hit one of them, and that's: Are there out, is there going to be an outage when there, the transition from old to new happens? And I think you said in the application the time frame for work is September to November slash December. Is that still correct? Yeah, I mean that's when we you know we, we still haven't bid this project yet. So if things yeah. come together like like we anticipate, that that would be the plan. Um, okay. Try to work on it once the driest. Um, the other question was Outage. outages. Yeah. Okay, be. Uh, there may be a, a brief outage on a, on a transition day, um, but there wouldn't be outages associated with the day-to-day -day work there throughout. Um, when it's all said and done, there may be some cutting over that needs to take place that might be beneficial to have it dead. It certainly wouldn't be a, anything of any duration. Okay. So. I'm all set. Okay, right. thank, you. thank you, Barry. Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, any of you folks that have come uh, as the butters this evening and you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, why don't you, you just come up to the microphone, give us your name, and I'll just add take it from there. Alan, quick question to Alan. Mark Martin, 10 King Street. I was just curious, in the poll at 10 King Street, you're saying that's only going to go up 10 feet and that's going to be the exact same poll? Okay. It's just going to be a single poll. Yes. That's it. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I'm Kirk with the Taylor community. Kirk Beswick, to be clear, of, uh, Vice President Facilities for them. I just had a couple kind of process questions for Barry. Uh, how will we be notified of any short outages during that in terms of uh, we have 41 cottages that will be impacted by that? Yeah, I, I don't foresee any short outages until, you know, they, they'll probably, I could not foresee one, one outage when we're, when we're at the end of this thing. Uh, Notifications that would be done just like we do any of our conversion outages. We try to get them out there, direct mail anybody affected, or post them, uh, certainly on Facebook. Um, but I don't really see the outage. I mean, okay. I don't see that it being a huge, a huge thing. It's not going to be multiple events. So. I don't know, that's good. I yeah. manage it just so everyone's clear Taylor community is yeah. a, a like plus 55 elderly place and little things like that can impact folks uh, so as long as we get notified that there may be even a glitch you know a flash of the lights or something that would be helpful to us yeah. a little bit of notification uh, sure. a couple of follow-up questions um, because we abut filter bed it looks like you're running up filter bed you have uh, three transformers at our emergency uh, path that goes over to filter bed will there be uh, a lot of noise while that whole stuff happens back there that our residents up on Taylor Drive will notice. Okay, um, I think I think what you're referring to is something on the distribution side, not necessarily on the on the okay. sub transmission side. We don't have transformers on okay. on this line we're referring to. There would be the only thing would have the substation tapped off that. Okay. So I think what you're seeing are transformers that are on the 
12 kV distribution. All right, so that's which, not affected. That's, that's a different, yeah, that's Excellent. a different line enti entirely. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, so again, I'm just concerned about any impact to us. Is there any financial impact that our residents need to know about? Is there going to be a tax increase? Uh, no. Um, much like we presented at when we went for funding for this, these projects are built into our current rate. So there is, they're funded by the electric rate, not the tax rate. There's no, it doesn't touch the tax rate whatsoever. These are already built in and funded by your existing rate that you pay. So this, you will not see an increase based on this project. This is already built into that, into that rate you're paying. In part of your capital planning, do you see any changes to the regular distribution lines that run up to the bed? We, we, um, we have a 10-year plan. There's still some 4 kV that runs up filter bed. That doesn't necessarily feed you. Um, you're fed off to 12 kV there. But um, that will be addressed, yes, as a, as a future project. Yeah. Yep. Yep. How would we go about getting prints for uh, the work that's happening here um, I, I'm sure we have them electronically. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can share them with you, Kirk. I, I can get a digital copy and send them to you. Me just that one page. Yep, that's the all one I that pertains to you. you. Yep. Sure. I, can, I can do that. Okay. Yep. okay. Very good. All right, that's let great. me know. Yep. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, Paul Whalen, 79 Glendon Street. Um, probably, and I might be a little bit premature because I know we're t mainly talking about wires at this point, but um, the substation will literally be next to my backyard when it goes in at the end of uh, Glendon Street. So that is my main concern. Some of the things that have already been addressed, uh, the poles and wires coming in over Back Bay right now, of course, they're dead. Uh, the substation is empty. When those are now energized with the lines feeding the town, um, just impact on those being over the head of how many thousands of people go up and down that rail trail. Um, also, I, I wanted to mention, I have chatted with Barry a few times. Uh, he's been quite understanding that this thing is coming into my backyard and uh, has offered to kind of work with me a little bit here. Um, but. Uh, the uh, other thing is just the substation structure. Um, safety of being in my backyard with these lines now coming in um, 10 feet above me. Uh, noise associated with substation and the transformers. Uh, any electrical magnetic fields that are gonna be created with this. Um, and then of course, certainly impacting what my home's value will become with a substation sitting right next to it. Um, a couple of things I heard tonight while Barry was speaking. Uh, one, keep in mind, we're not changing the only lines that are coming into town. They're still feeding the substation. Uh, I don't know how often the substation goes out, but I think it's typically more the lines going out than, than the substation. And then I also heard, Barry, you mentioned that we're only going to gain a mile and a half by adding this substation right downtown on the rail trail here um, and in my backyard. Uh, would it be possible to upgrade maybe one of the other older ones that you had said is, is needs to go offline? Because you said it's only going to gain you in a mile and a half. So I don't, I mean, that was a, a lot. <laughs> and I know, I don't know if I'm premature talking about substation well, I, tonight. I think that the hearing tonight is really focused on the 390 line. And if you guys want to connect maybe after the hearing, I don't want to stop the conversation, but we really want to kind of keep it tied to the project for this replacement yep. only. That's fine. I just wanted to make sure I started the conversation now because I know these things progress quickly. So. Yeah. But I, I uh, loved hearing there might be a potential of going under back bay. Right, thank you. Barry, did you want to respond to I mean, any of that? touch base on something that's associated with the line, but um, in regards to the dangers of this, this is not a you know, 115 kV line. This is a 34.5 line. Many communities run this right down the street as their distribution, as their distribution voltage. Um, so it's not, that, it, it's not that really high voltage line. It's high voltage for us, but in many communities, this is, this is distribution voltage, to be honest with you. So... Thank you. And any other comments from the public? The, uh, and I'll, I'll, okay. 
I'm Ian Whitmore. I'm at 10 Jonathan Hersey Road, have 80 acres, which... Do you have the pointer? So it's um, land that goes basically around that area and includes a square 20 acre 28 acre lot that abuts 19 mile brook and the town's filtration plant and the 390 line bisect set on the diagonal that lot is at the bottom of the line that runs from Bennett Hill so it's a straight straight downhill line uh, that ends in my 28 acre lot uh, at 19 mile brook. So I've got two concerns. The line is currently not well maintained in terms of soil erosion and invasive species. So I'm concerned that the rebuild is only going to exacerbate that issue. Uh, glossy buckhorn, buckthorn is all through 19 Mile Brook. And these invasive species, although the environmental scientists said they're there existing, so it's not an issue to deal with, they're there because uh, the environment has been created by the line. So I think it's incumbent that um, uh, those invasive species and the soil erosion reduction capacities of the vegetative bed uh, be addressed uh, during this rebuild. Um, so those are my two basic points. Invasive species, soil erosion is an issue right now. Uh, there are uh, ATV tracks that have become brooks, waterways, uh, running down that, uh, that hillside. Uh, so those issues need to be deal dealt with and then when the remedial work is done I want some assurance that uh, the soil erosion and the invasive species problems that are already existing are dealt with in a positive way and are not exacerbated by the construction. And as a side to Peter's question, um, there have been significant technology improvements in horizontal drilling and f related to fracking technology since 2006. So those cost estimates you heard previously may be far too high. Thank you. Gary, you, know, uh, you or someone? Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, unfortunately I'm not an invasive species expert, so I, I don't know if I have a lot to add there. Um, you know, as far as what we're doing, setting new poles, I don't think we're going to have that sort of impact where we're worrying about necessarily soil erosion, um, anything that's, that's, that's natural to that right-of-way. Um, whatever we do is going to be done with matting material for the vehicles to drive on. I mean, we're only visiting pole sites that are located you know every 220 feet in distances we're not we're not certainly not digging or excavating or filling anything uh throughout that right away um i don't know how much more i have to add Rex. Uh. Okay, th thank you with regards to our plan any of these disturbed soil surfaces that we have both in the upland areas and the wetland areas are to be regraded seeded and mulched to try to establish vegetation that is more common to the area versus the, uh, the invasive species. The, the soil erosion that I think you're referring to, and you noted that the ATV uh, use of that section of the power line right away is the primary, primary cause of, uh, cause of the, uh, some of the erosion that I did, that I did see there. So the only action I can think of is uh, 
the individual property owners doing whatever they can to try to make sure stuff's posted and then noting when people are using the property improperly with an ATV is contacting uh, New Hampshire Fish and Game since that's their area of enforcement. Thank you. The erosion goes beyond uh, just ATVs. The, you've created a clearing through a forest. And uh, the vegetation that's there currently does not have the same erosion preventive capacity as a forest. And so when you say you're going to reseed, my request is that you reseed with vegetative matter that does have, because it has to be low growing, obviously, Correct. can't interfere, but um, it's something that has to have significant uh, erosion reduction capacity. That whole hillside right now, especially on my 28 acres, is becoming very mucky, becomes very mucky, very wet, because the root structures don't have the same uh, uh, erosion re uh, preventive capacities. And uh, there is, because it's right at the bottom of that hill, there's significant water coming down there off of Bennett Hill. And it's how many hundreds of yards straight run down? The, the other question I have, uh, I, I don't know how you're going to get access to my 28 acres because I assume you're not going to cut through the brook with the heavy machinery. That's so do, do you need access through my property? I don't think we've, we've actually addressed which properties we're going to use for, for access. I know certainly I'm going to use the town-owned property when we come in on this end. Um, but the town property is on the other side of the brook. I'm on the Wolfboro right. side of the right. brook. Um, and I assume yeah. you're not going to disturb the brook. We haven't specifically nailed down sites that we would you know, request. So I've got logging sites. roads in my property, which I assume you might have to access. So I well, we we'll certainly have to have permission, and you'd have to be agreeing to, to well, I'm willing. I just, to, I just to do that. You know, would, would never impact somebody's property without them being on board with it or using it. Okay, so the bot Barry, bottom yeah. line is that you would be you would be notifying someone if you were going to use their property. Oh, certainly, certainly, okay. we would never we would never uh, in, you know uh, utilize anybody's property for staging or or travel without getting permission and and whatever whatever we needed to make sure they were on board with it. Okay, all right, thank you. So, so I got one. Uh, but but you don't have a good track record. Because last year when I got the notice that you were going to be going through my property, I phoned to make an appointment. Nobody ever got back to me. You phoned, okay. I think that it was the engineering company down in Concord. Yeah, I, I apologize gentlemen, for that. Gentlemen, that why don't you continue this outside? I guess, uh, yeah, I, 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 evidently that we, you know, we sent out notifications of just um, the serving that was taking place um, that, that HEB did. Um, I guess there were some miscommunications there, perhaps. I apologize for that, but, uh, yeah. One comment, yeah. Is it, is it possible that some jute mat or some uh, mat barrier would be proper in some of these uh, steeper, inclined places? Uh, Greg, this might be a question for you. I I think one of the things that we would certainly do is instead of doing the matting is when we regrade is in some cases because the ATVs have created these parallel troughs no. down downhill is effectively putting in small berms so that you take the water and you push it towards the edge of the tree line towards where you've got all that woody woody material that would that would better handle that velocity basically drop the water velocity to keep the surfaces stable so we can keep them so we can keep them seeded, but I mean, the long-term management's gonna be to have to try to manage the ATV use, because they'll undo whatever we, whatever we put in place. Okay, everyone all set? Uh, then I'll close the public hearing. Uh, any board members, any, any more questions or comments? Uh, do you have any recommendations or conditions that you would like the applicant to consider? I thought this was a very considerate and responsible plan, frankly. And then, uh, 
talked about uh, best practices. Mm -hmm. Certainly we've had testimony uh, that those will be in place. We, um, we don't, don't approve. We you can uh, we, don't, we don't seem to have any conditions yeah i mean you can simply state that you reviewed the project and have no further conditions or no recommendations however you'd like to to word it so um you can recommend it if you'd like to but uh you don't have to do that you can use whatever verb you'd like probably would be good if somebody would be willing to make a, a motion to recommend positively this uh, project to move forward uh, with no additional conditions. I'd be happy to make that motion. Okay, thank you. Motion has been made. Second. And seconded. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Or abstentions? Thank you very much, folks, and, and thank, thank you. you, folks, for, for coming. Thank you. Okay, the, uh, the next item I'm going to uh, step down. Von Dugan. We'll take over. I'm a member of the building committee for the library, so. Um, Madam Vice Chairman, uh, when this plan was put together, I had been chairman of the Board of Trustees of the library, so I was part of the creation of this plan in its early days. Um, I don't think it that necessarily disqualifies me from sitting here, especially since we're, we have no effective jurisdiction. But the board should be aware of that. And if there are any board members feel that my prior status get in the way of my present, let me know and I'll be happy to step down. Otherwise, I think I can continue. Does anybody have any comments or issues with my continuing to sit? Seeing none, good. I'm, I'm good with it. Vaughn. Mr. Goodwin has left. No. <laughs> Peter? <laughs> okay. Do we have a quarrel? It, 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 doesn't, it, it, it doesn't matter, but we're about to, I mean, we're about to begin a formal presentation, so. so I, right. I suppose well, we could. So proceed. the next issue. Uh, for the planning board is a formal submission public hearing for the town of Wolfboro um, Public Library site plan tax map 231-60 for a special use permit and we have Peter back and we look forward to hearing a description of the project from presenter. did you want to make those comments first or yeah, so I wanted to just make a, a quick comment. So the, the application that you saw before this was noticed to abutters. That's our, our normal protocol. However, this application, because the plan set was received just last Friday, we've decided not to, uh, and we were sort of aware of these delays in advance. We did not notice abutters for this. This will be presented again at our first June meeting. This is really just a preliminary step in the process. There are some not significant plan amendments, but plan amendments that do need to be done. So I think it's best that we uh, have a full public hearing in June on this. Uh, and I think that meshes with the timeline for the library. Uh, they have plenty of work to do on the interior of the building, I believe. Uh, so we'll see this project again in June, but this is a good first step in the process for review. May I ask uh, the planner why we are here then, if we're going to be looking at a different plan set? So it won't be a significantly different plan set and- no Public input? Well, we did publicly notice it in the paper, but I think it's important to get the board's comments and, and get those into the plan set now. I see no harm in having two public hearings on the project. Okay. Okay, I'm Cindy Scott. I'm the library director. The uh, building committee, which has been this particular group, has been working together pretty much the same people, a few changes. Since 2014, there are 13 members of the building committee, including members of the board of trustees, as well as uh, foundation members, uh, friends members, staff members, and uh, members of the public. Uh, we got right to work once the project passed, and the first thing we did was work with an energy consultant to help us prioritize and identify ways in which we could make the building more energy efficient and uh, sustainable. 
and we are, we've added some of those recommendations and we will be alternate bidding some of the things that we are not sure whether or not we're gonna be able to do based on um, when the bids come in, we'll know exactly where we are right now. Um, everything is still waiting for when we can go out to bid. But at this point, we're working with the architect to develop the plans to the point where they can do architectural plans and uh, get them then to the next phase where we go to the um, out to bid and to the construction company. So uh, the first thing that I wanted to show you here is the current exterior. This is very close to what the exterior of the building will look like. We've been working on the exterior first and then working on the interior. So we have um, removed some of the windows and added uh, more wall because that it's better insulation, but we also wanted to have a more cohesive looking building and also still have plenty of light and also have wall space on the interior. This also gives you an idea of um, some of the parking um, and access areas. Uh, do we have the interior plan or? I do not have the interior okay. plan. Okay, all right. So we are currently still working on the interior plan. It's essentially the same, but we, we started looking at making sure everything we need is in it and we have discovered a few items that were left out when we were doing the feasibility study. So we're dealing with those issues right now. We anticipate having the basic design work done in early June and um, moving on from that point. So one of the uh, other areas we were very concerned with is the property itself and m management of water issues on the site and Dave Ford's going to address the site plan itself. I'm gonna put the lights down just so we can see if Dave is gonna review some of this up on the screen so just so everybody can actually see this I'm gonna drop the lights. Okay, uh, Dave Ford, I um, have worked closely with the engineer, uh, Ben Dreyer from Underwood Engineers, and uh, due to the, the, um, the contract, uh, this is a, a very complicated project. Um, we, uh, working with the library um, the trustees and, and the whole team, uh, decided to use a construction management form of project delivery, and in fact, we went out for a request for proposals and we selected a construction manager and an architect as a team because we wanted to be able to have the back and forth uh, like Cindy was talking about on the energy. Um, we've got some good recommendations. We're going to be bidding um, the base and then the add-ons uh, hopefully we can afford. The drainage and the parking lot is going to be similar. <clears throat> so this is our existing entrance here. It's going to be widened and come in. This will be a one lane uh, coming through. Uh, oops. I'm sorry, that's my fault, Dave. Okay. So um, <clears throat> we'll have a, um, a entrance here. Uh, one of the things too is because this is a, probably a 65% drawing, uh, there are things that are going on that aren't shown here. I'll, and Cindy said we're going to have a, an emergency exit here, so the sidewalk will connect here, and there'll also be a sidewalk connection right on that side. Uh, but again, as you come through your main entrance, we'll have handicap parking. As noted in the plan review, we have some issues with this parking. The minor will get those corrected. Uh, there'll be a, a book drop-off, and we're still debating whether the drop-off will be right here, in which case it might slow people coming in. Uh, it could be moved over to here, get out of the way, but then the library workers will have to go a longer distance in the winter. So those are some of the small details we're working out. The traffic pattern will be, uh, for most parking to go around, a one-way loop around. But for those who are just dropping off or want to park on this side, there'll be a, a, you know, you'll be able to go this way. And again, all the way around, angle parking, and you'll be able to exit out that way. Uh, this is allowed uh, to maximize the amount of parking spaces uh, for the impervious area. Uh, again, um, we, are, uh, we have a couple areas where wetlands, this shaded area here and this shaded area here are going to be the wetland impact areas. Um, we are going to be, you can't see here in the middle, will be snow storage and there'll be some uh, planters here with under drains so when the snow melts it'll go underneath. 
Uh, as you're aware, we have major problems with the soil underneath the pavement. Uh, for years, Cindy and, and the, uh, has been dealing with uh, problems, and we've tried to fix it, but there's a very um, clay material under there, so we're going to be boxing that out, going down a good three feet with stone and under drain, so a lot of costs you'll not see will be underneath. Uh, the drainage outlet that we have is in this area, which goes to a basin in the public safety, then heads out uh, to Main Street, and then uh, it can go down uh, Christian Ridge Road or Crescent Lake Road. Snow storage will be in the back. One of the big issues we're concerned about are the abutters here. Um, they, uh, and we, now we store a lot of snow in the back. Uh, so in this design here, we have under drains with snow storage, and we have a small mound with a vegetation on top to help buffer the parking lot from the abutters. We'll have another snow storage area here. And as always, depending on the size of snow, we probably have to move snow out uh, at certain times of the year. Um, the vegetation, we have a vegetation, uh, excuse me, landscaping plan. And this area in here, okay, well, that's good. Yeah, so in here, there'll be kind of like a, a rain garden. Uh, so uh, we'll allow curb inlets and have vegetation in here to help with stormwater treatment. In this area here, we'll have a series of trees, uh, space so that we can still push snow in and the water can run into that area uh, to get, again, stormwater treatment. Uh, back to the other plan, I should have pointed out the sewer issue too, because with utilities, we have two uh, issues. Uh, right now, we have a, a water line that comes in, and we believe it'll be sufficient to uh, sprinkle the building. Uh, so that's already there. That's going to come in the backside. But we have the main sewer line for the town runs underneath the building. That's this line right here, and there's a sewer manhole right there. The building is going to extend out over that manhole, which will require us to do some special um, construction to make sure the manhole is removed and the pipe is sealed so no gases can get out of the pipe. Uh, there will be connections to that, but that's normal and with traps there shouldn't be any issues. Uh, so we, we work uh, very closely with the engineer and the contractor to make sure that's uh, going to be a safe connection. Uh, it shouldn't be an issue, but I just figured I'd point it out because it is, is something that is of concern. Um, I think those are the major highlights and I'll be more than happy to answer questions if anyone has any questions or if I missed anything, uh, Matt. Uh, I'll walk through a couple nitty-gritty things, um, but did, does anyone have any questions for Dave before I do that? Any bigger questions about the site? Uh, will you take great pains to make sure that those maple trees on the street remain, you know, protected? It looks like they're still on the plan after the, two of the trees. Yeah. These yeah. out yeah. Uh, right by the sidewalk. Yeah. So the, the plan shows three of the trees being removed in the front of the lot and the remaining two staying. I don't know if, that, if those trees truly can stay during the construction. Well, I, I think that this, is a good, this is why we can come back in a month. We can answer that question. If you can take that down, we can go over it with the architect. Uh, those are big trees, they have big root, and the, the, their canopy is going to be touching the building. So that is a kind of a problem. So we do have to take a close look at that, whether or not we can uh, spare them or whether or not we'll have to replant. I think uh, that's a question I, I can't answer that now, but yeah. there was concern about the size, the maturity of the trees. It, it would be hate to lose them, uh, but we, uh, we might be able to uh, talk to them and yep. see what special care we, we'd have to take. We'd have to protect you know, the, the root, not just the tree, but around it. Cause and we the can foundation is obviously moving significantly closer to that area, so there might be an impact to that. Oh yeah, when you, we got, again, the foundation is here, but the construction zone will be right up against the trees, yeah. which is there's some concern. But I think if, uh, if that's a, uh, a request, then we should see what we can do about yeah. protecting those. I, that, that may be possible. Just at this point, I, I, I wasn't aware that they were going to protect those. I thought we were going to be replanting out there. Well, I think, you know, if they're impossible to save or if they're so damaged that they're not viable for very many years, we should have a replacement plan. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, I think that's... that's would probably make more sense, but we'll, we'll, we'll look into that and have a better answer for you next week, I mean, next month. Not, uh, you know, a big tree replacement plan. I like big trees myself. Yeah, I don't like just little ones. I like the big ones, yes. <coughs> have an impact. Um, Dave, uh, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, your roof drainage, is that all getting collected and uh, put into your rain garden areas? Um, not specifically. Rain gardens are more for treating water off the parking lot, which is dirty. The water coming off the roof is going to be clean. 
we do need to mitigate it so it will be uh, directed into some of this underground storage to slow it down. But it really doesn't need to be treated, so it won't go into the rain gardens. It'll go into the pipes on the ground and try to slow it down. To because uh, with the drainage analysis and the increased runoff, we're trying to detain some of that water on site. Uh, but if um, so, the, the 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 rain gardens here will be taking the runoff from the parking lot. There'll be more than enough. Uh, the the runoff off the roof is going to be significant, and um, that'll be. Um, um, into infiltration trenches and again trying to get it back in the ground and try to knock down the peak runoff but it's really not dirty water like the storm water off the off the uh, parking lot. I got that so uh, so what are we what are we planning to uh, mitigate moisture that ends up down in the basement area so we don't end up having to uh, deal with that twice we deal with it with the roof then we and then it goes down to the ground and then we have to uh, either Dehumidify it or get rid of it somehow. I mean, it's it's the the soil in this area is very clayish, so you know it doesn't want to go into the ground. So we'll be uh, the whole parking lot will be taking out the poor soils and putting in stone. That's going to be the reservoir underneath the parking lot. So we'll, the water will be uh, taken away from the building by pipes and then try to infiltrate back in the ground where we replace the soil and then the overflow will go back into the drainage system. Uh, in the basement now, that, that will have to be a dehumidifier system. That's still always going to be damp because you're in the, in the basement. Uh, and, and there's not much plan down there. Most of the, all, all the new stuff is up above. I, I don't the, the, basement. The, uh, the basement is going to have most of the things removed from it. It's just going to have the electrical and maybe a little storage. So we are anticipating having two dehumidifiers down there, in, one in each room. Mm -hmm. yeah, but again, I'm, I'm still uh, focusing on the water that comes off the roof. Are we, are we piping it away? Yep. Yes. Yeah, because there's going to be areas under the, where, the, where it comes off the roof that go down and, and take the water down to piping that then takes it away. From takes the it away. Where is it taken away to? Uh, the outlets, we have uh, two outlets. The, 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 you know, in, in here will be the drainage in the, in the retention area, but the pipe, there's a catch basin that goes out to the parking lot and then comes out to strange. So we have one this way, and then there's a, a drainage system that goes this way now. So those are our two uh, hard pipe outlets, and that's where the water will be going, because then they uh, connect to the system on Main Street, and that system, uh, it goes down Christian Ridge Road and then comes out behind the hospital. So there's, so there's no way for us to be a good example, like we uh, impose other people when they do their businesses in town to take their water and put it into a uh, rain garden, an area where it can collect on the site. We're, we're, we're not going to do that. We're going to send it down the No, no. Well, we, well, so we are treating the surface water with the rain gardens here and here, so we are getting some treatment. And we are um, trying to meet the town regulations on not maximizing the runoff off-site. But the reality is not all the water is going to go in the ground. The soils just do not allow it. So we have to, you know, we can slow it down. We can get some in. But at some point on the higher rainfalls, it, we are going to have to, you know, discharge uh, downstream. It's just because of the site. There's not much more we can do with it. But we are going to be spending additional money in that parking lot underneath. And that's where the, uh, the storage would be and the, uh, the ability to slow, the, to knock the peaks down so we don't have any peak increases off-site, which is kind of what we make other applicants do. So the, the, the excess runoff is going to go into the parking lot, percolate down through the stones, and then when it fills up that reservoir, it gets by gravity fed into the system? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it, it'll, it, it, yeah it has to have an outlet, so yeah. it slows it down eventually through the rocks. It'll come out of pipe into the catch basin into the town drainage system. You, you figure that's a, a workable and feasible solution to the water problem on site? It is. That, that's, uh, again, we'll be using a, a couple of different BMPs here, but th that's, that, that's the infiltration. And again, every site is limited by its geology, so there's only yeah. so much you can do. But I, I think it's a, it's a good design. Uh, it's, it's consistent with what we've required other people to do and what we've been trying to do on our projects and trying to get the water in the ground as much as possible. But you have to have a backup plan. I can't not have a pipe yeah. because we, you know, there are times of the year where the ground will just not take the water and we don't want and, and also, we've got to keep the structure of the pavement because we're going to have a lot of selects on top of the stone so that we don't have any heaving in there either. We don't want to, uh, we gotta, we're going to rip out all that bad soil so we can have, uh, the, 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 the not uh, have a good parking lot. Yeah, I remember from my time, the water 
problem in the parking lot was one of the difficulties that had to get dealt with, and it sounds like you've got a workable plan. I'd like to save most of my questions for when we do the real hearing with the public here, and the mid-butters have been noticed, but I do have one comment for that time. Um, I'm somewhat concerned for the impact of water runoff and snow storage onto the Wyman property in the back. Uh, they've always had a problem with water runoff from the library. Yes. And I'd like to hear at that time how that is going to be solved. Sure. And I'm well, hoping that she will be here so she can comment on the solution and whether it feel, she feels good about it herself. Um, <clears throat> One only, other, only one other question I had, kind of a uh, general question. Uh, the, the way snow storage is being handled on site, I mean, that's a problem because you've got such a big parking lot, you've got a lot of snow build up there. Um, <clears throat> is the central snow storage location that I see on the plan right now the best solution that, that you have been able to come up with dealing with snow storage? It's, it's a divide and conquer, so it's not all going to go in the middle. It's going to be shed on the back and along this side here and, again, in that corner. So, uh, like, you know, it's divide and conquer. Um, we, uh, again, you don't have a lot of options when you have so yeah. much impervious area, uh, but we will be careful, uh, and as we have done in the past, if we have multiple storms, uh, some of the snow will actually start backing up in parking spaces and we will have to haul it away. Yeah. And that's just the life in Wolfboro in the winter. No, I, I understand that. It's just looking at the plan, the size of the snow storage area is eating up an enormous amount of the parking lot. And it's right smack in the center of the parking lot with parking spaces on either side of it. Um, I'm, my question is, is this going, how are the drivers and how are the patrons of the library going to deal with a snow storage area that they're going to have to drive around, park in front of? Are they then, how do they then proceed from say the back parking spaces into the library itself. That's an excellent question because we will have to have a crosswalk right through that. So we will have a, you know, a, a, a pathway through here. That was something that was noted. Um, and and uh, so in the same thing here, we'll have a pathway uh, and, and we might end up losing uh, one or two parking spaces so yeah. we can have uh, the, the, but the, the one thing we've done is we're trying to maximize parking and minimize impervious area. And to do that is to have a single lane. So instead of having two-way traffic, we have one-way traffic and trying to get as much parking off that single lane as possible. And we've looked at different alternatives. Uh, again, we are pushing the limit on the impervious area. So we try to open up, have as much grass area. We thought this would be a nice, a pleasant area with the tree, with some, uh, you know, in the summertime, uh, these are maple trees, so we'll have nice shade trees in there and uh, it'll, it'll benefit, it'll be much nicer in the summertime. Mm -hmm. In the wintertime, uh, we're not talking about pile big, snow, uh, big piles of snow here. It's just as we plow those, these areas here that will be pushed in, most of the bigger piles will be on the edges because we don't want to kill the trees. We're going to have to be careful uh, with those trees, especially the first few years. Uh, so we'll be very careful when we, when we do plow that. But I think it's a, it's a, it's a good, because it breaks up the parking lot too. You don't want to have a, just a big C, so having it right in the middle, I think it, it kind of worked. Uh, with us trying to maximize the parking, minimize impervious, and, and try to have it aesthetically pleasing. And you're going to be pushing snow into the wetland? Uh, right on the edge, yep. Yeah. Right, right over so here. How are you going to control um, your plows from pushing snow? Is there going to be some indication for the plow operator that should plow no further than because he's now going into wetland? Yes, we have those uh, on the trucks. We, we regulate them, so you can't go, can't hit, knock over mailboxes. It, it, snow plowing is, is snow plowing. I mean, it's, it's, we have issues. Uh, we're going to train them. We're going to stake out the corners. We're going to do everything possible, and we're still going to break things. I, I, I never, I've never driven a plow truck. Uh, Brad probably has. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult. You know, we have 66 miles of road. We have a dozen parking lots in the middle of a snowstorm when you can't see and you're working for 24 hours. We're not going to have perfection. Things are going to get hit. So it's a jurisdictional wetland. It's not a very important wetland. It doesn't have a real serious impact in the area. It doesn't do very much. It's man-made. But it is better to keep the snow out of it than in it, if that's at all possible. The only other question I had, and I'll say the rest, as I said, for next time, you're going to re be removing 230 linear feet of stone wall? Uh, the on, the, on the slot, yep. Yeah, yeah. There's no way that the, the work can be done without removing that much of the stone wall. I remember that at the time there was thought that 
this stone, this, the parallel stone walls is an old sheep run. It would be nice to be able to show people that this was the sheep run. It runs into in across Goodrich Road and into the town gardens. Um, but you're taking it, away it, one part of the wall. Is that that uh, Matthew? Is this so right here? It's it's right in this area right here. It's hard to see. Uh, give me one moment. It's on one of your plans. It, it's it's indicated and noted on one of your. It's plans. on the existing conditions plan. It's this stone wall right here, Dave. Yeah, it's on. Um, it's the existing conditions and removal plan. Correct. Yeah. It, 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 you know, it'd be kind of odd to have it in the middle of a parking lot, but um, we'd have to move it. We can, we, we can talk to the contractor about whether or not we can relocate it, but it's right in the middle of parking, so it has to go. Um, and uh, it, it will be saved going the rest of the way, because we own the property back. And um, we could look at, because because they're nice field stones, and um, depending on our site work contract, and because of the way we're working, maybe we could stockpile them and we could maybe put the wall on the other side of the parking lot? It's partially ruined, so it isn't like it is elsewhere, like in the town gardens, the, the parallel lines are maybe a foot and a half, two feet high already, and they're, they're, they're clear what they were supposed to be doing. On the library property, one side of the stone wall is good, the other side, the part that you're thinking of moving, has crumbled and is, is only there if you know what it was supposed to look like. It was just, I remember from my time that the library was thinking of maintaining that and using it as a feature in the garden that was going to be set up on that part of the property to tell people who come there that this was an old sheep run and it runs all the way down close to the lake, I suppose. But if you have to remove it to do the work, it has to be removed. It's just a shame that it does. Yep. I don't think it's, it's not a killer. No. It's just a shame. Well, and again, the only thing we can offer is that we could save the stones and we could recreate it because there is plenty of land there, but that's something that I don't, it's right now right in the middle of the parking lot, so it's, it's scheduled to go. Okay, thank you, Dave. And if you have any other questions that would require engineering, yes. uh, if we knew ahead of time, you don't have to tell us tonight, but if you could email us yeah. so we knew what's coming, uh, that's better than a surprise so we can have answers for you. Yep. Dave, it, it looks like the... Uh, increase in perme or impermeable surface is in some ways just related to the increase in the floor space. Um, and parking. And, and it also looks like uh, presently the parking lot has no place for the water to go. And what's happening is that you're creating rain gardens for where that water goes. And so therefore, in many ways, you're, you're making the water flow better than it was before. Is that yes. right? Yeah, I think we can make an argument that while some of the increased runoff is going to be clean because it's off the roof, the, uh, the addition of the um, BMPs, the rain garden, uh, the snow storage area, which will also act as a BMP, and on the back of the property where we'll have the, um, the mound to protect the property owners in the back of the property, and when the snow is there, it'll be able to melt and go into the under drain. Um, so those are all going to benefit and uh, should see a, a net positive impact with regards to stormwater treatment. Thank you for bringing that up. So on the vicinity map, I notice it's a pork, pork chop lot, um, and there's a lot behind it that doesn't look like it has any access other than through this lot. You Can you pull that up, Matt? Can you go back to that? Uh, yep, I can. Uh, sorry about that. The, the, the so title? are you talking about sheet? Which sheet? It's on the cover. On the co oh, the cover sheet. Yep. Tiny. Yep. Let's zoom in. I'll get it up here. Juan, you're referring to this lot right here. This. Oh. This lot right here, Dave. That's the town gardens. Yeah, that's the town garden parcel. So there's no future intention of driving through here to get. There. No, no, Goodrich we've, Road. We've, oh, sorry. I, I, my understanding is Goodrich Road is the access to Town Gardens. We we do think in the future yep. it would make for a nice uh, path and potential ex expansion of the Town Gardens into maybe more of this this land. We we could do something yeah. with. So um, I'd love to be able to create a nice garden and walking path and. You'll disappear there for a few hours every day, won't I'm you? I'm gonna. I'm tell you what. I'm gonna play Powerball tomorrow night, and if I get it, I'll build it for you. <laughs> It has access. It, it does, yeah, it does have access, yep. 
Will you meet them? I don't see it on the plan, but it was something that was talked about in back in the day. Is there going to be a likelihood of a walking path from library property down through the parallel sheep run walls, perhaps, to Goodrich and the town's garden? I, I think that's a very high possibility, uh, and, uh, and, and that's because that's it's easy. It's already there. All we got to do is clear the brush. Yeah, yeah. So it would take a, a few man hours to make that possible, as long as we're not talking about an improve. Um, th that would be something, again, a project uh, after we, we – right now we're, we're tight budget. We're trying to make sure you get the most building and, and, and uh, um, the infrastructure. We definitely see that as a good possibility in the future. The town garden is managed by the Conservation Commission, and I think they would be very happy yes. to work with the library to get that land opened a little bit and get the town garden more active. Oh, I, I definitely, with the Pathways Committee and everyone else, I see that happening. We, we did meet with Dan Coons and walked the site and discussed some of the possibilities for the, for the land in the, in the future. And we'll continue to, to, to work with the Conservation Commission on that because we would like to see some sort of a pathway and garden in the back area there. Uh, when I was looking at the pictures up there, the building looked notched on the roof. Are those solar panels? N uh, if you're talking about the oh, things on top one. of the roof, Keep there's... Going. Keep going. Um, that one. Those are solar tubes for, to let in natural light. So a lot, obviously a lot of the items in my review are pretty technical in nature. I think they can be passed right along to the applicant for adjustment to the plan. I don't think I need to review them tonight unless everyone would like me to. Uh, I intended to share this with the engineer anyway, and we, uh, Dave spoke to the engineer yesterday as well. Um, so I, won't, I don't need to review these if the board is comfortable with that. If you have any comments, though, before we do notice the abutters, please just let me or Dave know, and we can uh, incorporate those into a new plan set. Just got one more question. Will they have to shovel the roof? <laughs> no. <laughs> if they are, we got big troubles. No, that's a, uh, a, I'm not sure the pitch of the roof. Are we, uh, eight, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's uh, the interesting part about this, and one of the reasons we select the architect, because we are building a roof over the roof. The roof that we've had to shovel for the last uh, 15 years is underneath that structure. And, it's, and uh, we're going to be putting in, you know, the, the structural engineers and everything. Uh, this was a criteria that we would not be having to worry about the sagging roof. I get called when it comes down an inch, we have to go up there. No, that, that won't be uh, any more of that. Um, we will have to take care of, of snow coming off the roof, and we are planning, like with our drip edge, making sure we're collecting that water, taking it away. Same thing with that snow. We got to be very careful what we plant and make sure we have access so we don't you know, because there will be snow coming off the roof, but it, it, it won't, be, uh, won't be a problem we have now. Is it asphalt or metal? Uh, right now it's asphalt shingle. It's asphalt. So, so it won't you, come off so much. No, it'll be very slow. It'll melt and, you know, and, and come off, but with the wind blowing, you have drifts coming off the roof, and, and uh, it won't be like we do now. We shovel, and then we inundate, and then we have to move it away. It won't be that bad, but we are planning uh, to have access around so we can do proper maintenance. Does anybody from the public have anything that they want to add? So Peter P. Wan is asking about. Yeah. So did you look into solar panels for the roof? Yes, we've talked about doing solar. We don't have uh, any solar included in this budget, but we are building in the capability to be able to add solar in the future. This has been a very enlightening evening for me. Um, and I just want to say that the changes to the facade, I think um, the Heritage Commission will be very pleased with. I think the reduction in the window space and the additional brick wall surface, as well as what look like columns or pilasters or something there along the facade, make it look a little more traditional and a little more in keeping with the character of South Main Street. So I hope it continues to evolve in that direction or stays the way it is. I think it would be great. Thank you.
So I guess we are done with comments, unless anybody has any conditions that they want to. So what I would recommend, because we did notice this in the paper, but not to abutters, I would actually recommend continuing the public hearing to a date certain. And that date would be June um, 5th, the evening of June 5th at 7 p.m. So if someone wanted to make a motion to that effect to continue the public hearing to June 5th. Also, I move that we continue this public hearing until, not this public hearing, but to a public hearing June 5th. That's fine. All those in favor? Aye. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you. I don't think you're going to make the beginning of the Celtics game, Dave. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, still got Thanks, 10 minutes. <laughs> See you, Dave. Thank you, Cindy. Okay, the um, uh, next item is public comment. Mr. Whalen, did you want to make any more public comments? I, I or? <laughs> okay, well, now's your big chance. That's good. Okay, um, so then the, the next item are some action items. The uh, first one is a. Um, so. This is a relatively straightforward merger. It was obviously signed by the Board of Selectmen a few weeks ago. This is to, to merge the McBride lot, which was acquired by the town of Wolfboro, with the existing public safety building lot. Um, there are obviously a couple functions of this, the first of which is the long-term planning for the public safety building lot in the event that we do choose to make some modifications to the existing building or build a new building on this parcel. Any additional acreage that we can gain is advantageous to us. Additionally, not to go back to the library project, but this area could potentially be an opportunity for staging for the front of the building's construction. It's not related to the merger going on here, but I just wanted to note that about this particular area of land. If this merger is approved by the board, it will create a lot that's about two acres exactly in size. Um, and beyond that, uh, there obviously there's a large tree located on that lot. There's a, uh, an impervious area, which is a driveway to the public safety building lot, which is used relatively in infrequently. Uh, there'll be no changes as a result of the approval of this merger. It's really about the long-term planning for that facility. That's why we're moving forward with this. And the building is gone? Yes. It's already gone. That's correct. Yep, the building is gone. So it's, uh, there's no, yep, no nonconformity is created here. It's compliant from a... Uh, from an area perspective and road frontage perspective, there are really no modifications to the way at the site, uh, no modifications to the site as a result of this merger it's, if it's approved. Um, and one of the Route 28 proposed plan shows the uh, driveway. I mean, That's correct. So the, the Route 28 study, one of the recommendations, which is based on what happens from the public safety building study, but one of the recommendations is to align the an exit or entrance, whichever it may be, from the public safety building with Christian Ridge Road, which is directly across. The way it's configured now, having the access points sort of staggered, with Christian Ridge being here and the public safety building here, is really not the safest way to configure the lot or configure the exits. So um, the idea is by adding this parcel to the existing public safety building parcel, it would allow for that exit to be constructed. So there's... <coughs> Technical question. Does the planning board have any authority over this merger since it's town property and has been recommended or approved by the select persons? I believe the planning board does have authority over this. I think it does have authority over this. We couldn't disapprove, could we? Well, we, we could make some suggestions for yeah, I, how the property is used or... Yeah, Mike, I, I guess I honestly don't know the answer to that question, um, but I think that the board certainly has a purview to make recommendations. Would the town have to strictly follow those recommendations? No, I would, I would say they wouldn't. So did the study come out before we spent over $100,000 to dig the parking lot out at the fire station and put three feet of gravel in there? So the, on the, libra wait, the library facility or the? The fire station. We dug all the way around that, three feet down, and put all new material, and now you're going to move the driveway over? Nope, we're not, we're not saying that we're going to move the driveway, definitely. That's just been sort of, as part of the effort for 2024, we've been talking about potentially moving that driveway over. We wouldn't do that, A, until the public safety building study is done, and we determine whether or not we're going to be even beyond that lot and what it's going to look like. And 
Well, I think that's a short answer to it. No, we're not going to make that investment in reconfiguring the driveway until we know whether or not there's going to be a, a, a building on the slot. We wouldn't do that. Did we look at uh, connecting the roadway with the library? So, absolutely. And one of the, so the, I can tell you that the Public Safety Building Planning Committee, which is really focused on feasibility and not necessarily designing the building, but one of the two preliminary designs that we have does include what I would call an emergency access between the library facility and the public safety building. Um, it's something that obviously exists now informally. I think it's a good long-term plan. The only key there would be to make sure that wherever that access is between the two parcels matches the circulation plan that's being proposed for the library because obviously the library has a very clear kind of counterclockwise circulation plan. We don't want to put vehicles into a spot where they would counter that circulation. So it would likely be at the rear of the lots in order to match that circulation plan that's, that's proposed. What's the point of the emergency? So the emergency access is, is primarily for the fire and police departments. That's really dependent on whether or not a future building has one or two access points. If it only has one access, points, the I access point, the idea is if there's an incident in that area, the fire department and the police department have to have a secondary means of egress from the lot, and that could potentially be over the library site. So we've talked to the library folks, and they're open to potentially having that emergency access in the future, but at this time it's not being incorporated into the library plans. I'll just point out that when I was chairman of the Board of Trustees for the library, we tried to get access to Bunn's lot, mm -hmm. McBride lot. We were told at the time public safety could not share an access route with the library for public safety purposes. That's correct. That would, but that's referring to an entrance or an exit to the lot directly. Well, you're talking about essentially the same thing, having fire nope. and police having an emergency access through the back of the parking lot of the library out the front of the library, yes? They're, they're not the same thing because one, one of those two is an access to a public road and one of them is an access between two parking lots. So the, I believe what was... Pro That's a very fine point, my... my I, I mean, I disagree because the, the... Where's that access through the parking lot gonna go? A fire has to do an emergency move out because mm -hmm. something's happening in their building. Yep. They're using the emergency exit and they're going through the town library's parking lot, where are they going? To the road, correct? That's correct. Well, but there you have the same thing. It's essentially the same species. So you're talking about what, the first point you made about when you were on the trustees, that was an, a, a combined entrance and exit for both the library and public Some safety uses, correct? Access, and they, they, were, they were completely against that. Okay, so that's one access. Public safety building access and a library access, and then a shared access between the two, you have two access points to the public street. So it's a redundancy issue, in my opinion. I think they're, I just think they're totally different. Okay. But I, I, it's fine. It's also good planning to link parking lots generally. Yeah, so we had even gone a step beyond this and proposed essentially a shared, I talked about a shared parking lot between the two facilities. But the concern then is that you'd get people visiting the library that would go through the public safety building entrance and exit, and that didn't seem to make sense based on the traffic patterns and emergency apparatus moving through that, that area. So the emergency access, access at this time, I think, is the preferred solution. The library could potentially, if we move forward with that option, the library could potentially have the ability to open that if they have large events and take advantage of the public safety building's parking. But we haven't really scoped that as of this point. Sounds to me like a catastrophe in the making right there. Okay. I think we're getting far outside the scope of the lot merger that's in front of you, to be quite honest with you. This is an interesting question. Okay. Yeah. Gated? It will be gated. Again, we're, we're just discussing the possibility of having the emergency access. I absolutely agree. So if we have an emergency exit, there would be some access control. Uh, my expectation is that it would be a gate controlled through the dispatch department in the public safety building. Um, I think that would be the most viable way to do it. And again, 
it's just an option we've discussed to have the library have some access to it as well if they have large events. But as you can see from the library plan that's been submitted, they're actually going above the required parking for the lot. So I don't anticipate that we'll have a real need. Um, additionally, there's apparently some informal agreement. Uh, well, I won't, I won't get into that issue, but th I don't think that we'll have an issue on our hands. But uh, I'm glad Mike brought that up because I have concerns about that too. I think mm -hmm. we have to move very slowly and make sure that both facilities are, are talking to each other and addressing each other's concerns. Mm -hmm. I agree. Is that, I mean, sometimes people, things get a little out of kilter. Yeah, and I think it's, it's, this is a particularly challenging situation because we have a project that is in out years of CIP and a project that is approved and built and scheduled for construction this year. But anything we can do, I think, to at least plan for future connection between the two sites, if that's what we, the direction we want to move in, I think we should do that. Um, so, yeah, I think that's the short of it. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, other... Oh, okay, back, meanwhile, back to the merger. <laughs> yeah, no, these are good questions because, the, you know, and I, I apologize for being sort of argumentative, but we are sort of in the very preliminary stages of planning the public safety building site, so um, I can't defend a lot of the logic that we're sort of throwing around right now on that project, but I'd be happy to sort of present the findings of that to the board uh, when they're done in June or July of this year, I believe will be in July. So I can bring that to the board and present it. Okay, that, would be, that would be great. Yep, I can do that. Okay, anything else on, on the merger of um, uh, the McBride property? Uh, if not, would somebody be willing to make a motion to merge these two lots? So moved. Thank you. Uh, somebody want to make a second? Okay, a motion has been made and seconded to uh, merge the uh, Town of Wolfboro lots tax map 231-59 and 231-57. Uh, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, great. And uh, the next lot merger is for um, Douglas Smith. Tax map 30-3 and 30-2. Um, any issues with, with this one? Question for the planner. I did not prepare a review for this. Okay, then, then maybe you can help me anyway. Yep. Um, on this hand-drawn map, I guess done by Mr. Smith, it seems. Um, can you give me the locus where we are on Beach Pond Road? Yes, sir. I can. And actually, why don't I hold this up? Question is, is, it, is, that, is that Ferber Lane that we're looking at up there or not? That long? No. No, that is not. Uh, no, I don't believe that is Ferber Lane. Okay. But I will pull it up for everyone so we can get a sense of where it is. Is that that new driveway which has been driven in off of Beach Pond Road? One moment, Mike. Let me just pull this up real quick and I can answer your question. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, great. Mike, Ferber Lane is um, is down in this is is south of this. This is significantly north, closer to the upper beach pond area. At the bottom of the hill. Okay. Yep. You, when you go around the shop corner and start heading up the incline, it's yeah. like a fourth driveway on the right hand side right there. Okay, thank you, man. Yep. Where does that driveway go? That driveway. So this is a this is a spinoff, a state uh, society for the protection of New Hampshire's forest parcel right here. It continues back into another lot, which I believe is vacant. Yeah, 
These are both vacant lots. So I'm not even clear on what the condition of that driveway is. Take a look here. Is that the one that goes straight up the hill? To be honest with you, it, it may not even be an existing driveway. It may be overgrown at this point. It's just shown as a driveway on the tax map. I'm not sure if that's accurate or not. It doesn't appear to be. I'm just trying to get my, my, my bearings on this yeah, map. That's a driveway, John. Two and three. Yeah. I don't think that I. I, I driver in the house. The driveway's got nothing to do with it. Talk about this driveway here. Also, two lots. It's a narrow access to Beach Pond Road. That's all that is. It's, it's nothing. To do I, I honestly have no idea where they're merging these, but one. And, and to be clear, that doesn't really matter to the board. But the other thing I would point out is that. If they wanted to construct a structure on the other side of the driveway, some sort of garage, for example, they would not be able to do so right now because they have a set, they have a property line right there. So I don't know if that's the proposal that they're going to bring to the, the my office, but they would have an issue if they tried to do that. Okay, well it is sketched on here. Is driveway, the, the access, yeah. Kathy. Yeah, but Yeah, oh, yeah. That's, the existing. Yeah, so dr that's the existing driveway. So the driveway is may even be encroaching as it is. Well, then maybe they're coming more in conformance. Well, I think they're definitely, yeah, they definitely are. I mean, I think that they're probably, they're likely crossing the other property as it is, and they probably should technically, well, yeah, I, I think that it is an increase in the conformity we know of the lot. zone this is? This is in the, I believe it's in the, Rural agricultural zone. Yeah, it's in the rural agricultural zone. Which, and that's. Are you asking for dimensional? Five acres. The rural agricultural zone is, in fact, a five acre minimum lot size. Yeah. Yep. And 400 feet of frontage. Okay, so they're coming more in conformance with the Absolutely. zoning. Yep. Yeah. They're, they're creating a fully conforming lot based on the zoning. Great. Um, and, and they're uh, addressing yep. nonconformity or Correct. intrusion or whatever. Yep. Okay. I see no issue with the proposal. They're, they're uh, like ownership. Is that 163 or 763? For you old timers here, I'm pretty sure that's Andy Milligan's old house. If you know where he lived up there. Oh, oh, okay. He had that fork driveway there, I remember working up in there on it. Okay, would uh, somebody, anybody have any other issues with this? Move ahead and uh, maybe be willing to make a motion to merge Hexlop. Uh, 30-3 and 30-2. So moved. Seconded. Motion has been made and seconded. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed abstentions. Okay, great. Planning board member vacancy. Oh, okay. That's, yeah, that's the society. Okay. So one of these is Tim Cronin's letter, which we've already seen.